Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, dear guests, dear academic partners and uh, friends, welcome to Bogdan Baturki Memorial Lecture 2022. My name is Natalia kanenko friesen I am the director of the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies is a global leader in our field, and uh, we uh, pursue an important mission to produce, preserve, and disseminate expert knowledge about Ukraine and Ukrainians in Canada and worldwide. Located in Edmonton and Toronto, and of course with offices around the world of partners in Ukraine, we uh, facilitate sustained scholarly engagement and cooperation between Canada and Ukraine, partner institutions and research around the globe, as well as between diverse cultural and ethnic groups in Canada and beyond. We gather in very difficult times. We have been watching with trepidation and horror of what is happening and unfolding in Europe and Ukraine in particular. So these are trial times for all of us. Nonetheless, we believe in our work and we believe in the necessity to maintain and sustain reflective and critical dialogue on what we study, what we do, and in relationship to what is going on in the world and in Ukraine in particular. Today, I connect with you from the Treaty 6 territory, the land of many indigenous peoples, from a town we know as in Edmonton or land of Amiskwasi Waskahikan. This is the territory which witnessed the unfolding of many important cultural traditions, and we enrich our own lives as Ukrainian studies academics, uh, is based on our experience working here. Without much ado, I would like to pass on uh, the word to the director of research program on research and culture. It's the program which is hosting today's event, Dr. Heather Coleman, who will be our leader and will introduce our speaker and who will uh, make sure we're all engaged in the critical and important conversation today. Heather, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Natalia. Each year, uh, the research program on religion and culture at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies sponsors the Bohdan Botsyrkiv Memorial Lecture. These lectures honor the memory of Professor Bohdan Botsyrkiv, one of the founders of CIUS and an eminent political scientist and internationally renowned specialist in human rights, Soviet religious policy, and the history of the Ukrainian churches. Dr. Bohdan Botsyrkiv began his academic career at the University of Alberta, where he taught in the Department of Political Science from 1956 to 1969. He went on to teach at Carleton University in Ottawa, where he founded the Institute of Soviet and East European Studies, which is now the Institute of European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies, and served as its first director. A specialist in Soviet politics with a special emphasis on Soviet Ukraine and church state relations, he was the author of a great many works, books and articles on the subject. His final book, The Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church and the Soviet State, 1939 to 1950, was published by CIUS Press in 1996 and remains the authoritative work on the subject in English. In 1994, mm -hmm. Professor Botsyrkov's generous donation of his extensive library and archives to the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies represented the first step in the eventual creation of the research program on religion and culture. This collection contains many unique items and documents pertaining to the Ukrainian church, including copies from the closed archives of the Communist Party and the KGB, and it served as the basis for the program's reference library. The annual Bohdan Batsyrkov lecture brings to Edmonton a specialist working in the subject areas that preoccupied Professor Batsyrkov throughout his career, religion and politics and Ukrainians. Usually this is an important opportunity for a meeting of, of scholars and the wider Edmonton community. And, but this year, like last, we're holding the lecture virtually and expanding that community to anyone who chooses to participate via Zoom. So welcome to our audience near and far. It's a great pleasure to introduce this evening's Bohdan Batsyrkiv lecturer, Professor Catherine Warner. Dr. Warner is a professor at the Pennsylvania State University with appointments in history, anthropology, and religious studies. 
She earned a doctorate in cultural anthropology from Columbia University. Using ethnographic and archival methods, her research centers on religion, human rights, and conflict mediation. She's the author or editor of six books on Ukraine, including her most recent, Everyday Religiosity and the Politics of Belonging in Ukraine, which is, came out this year, in 2022. Her research has been supported by awards from the United States National Science Foundation, the Swiss National Science Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Social Science Research Council, and the National Council for Eastern European and Eurasian Research. In 2014, she convened the Working Group on Lived Religion in Eastern Europe and Eurasia, which is an ongoing research network of scholars studying religion and public life. In 2020, she was awarded the Distinguished Scholar Prize from the Association for the Study of Eastern Christianity. So it's hard to imagine someone who, 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 who is more better suited to walk in the footsteps of Bogdan Batsyurkiv and his interests. In the world before February 24th, when we planned this lecture, we imagined that Professor Warner would share some of the findings of her new book. Her original abstract spoke of the important role that religious ideas and practices played in underpinning a hybrid Russian-Ukrainian war. But her abstract also suggested that the politicized version of religion did not necessarily summarize and could not contain the ways in which everyday religiosity played into relatedness and belonging in Ukraine. So much has happened since the Russian invasion and not the least in religious life. This evening, Professor Vonner brings the insights of a career long interest in religion and memory and identity in Ukraine and the findings of her, of her recent work to consider these dramatic developments. The title of her talk is Religion, Relatedness and Belonging in Ukraine. May I just make a quick technical <laughs> comment before we turn over the microphone? Um, please, uh, you'll notice at the bottom of your screen in the center, a Q&A uh, icon. And please feel free to um, type in any questions you have as Professor Warner is speaking, uh, or at the end, after she speaks, we will have a time for questions and answer, and I will be reading questions from the Q&A section. So you're free to put them in there while we're having the question and answer, but also during the talk this evening. So without further ado, Professor Warner, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Heather, and thank you, Natalka. I'm so pleased to be here and especially honored to be giving this memorial lecture in honor of uh, Bogdan Boskyorkiv. He's a well-known and highly respected scholar of Ukrainian religious history, whose scholarship continues to have import for me and for generations of scholars who are inspired to pursue his level of scholarly excellence. So thank you very much for this invitation. These are indeed extraordinary times. And I will try to use this opportunity of this lecture to make some sense of them. I believe that the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which began a little over one month ago on February 24th, with a broad land, air, and naval assault that has already and will continue to unleash staggering changes on multiple levels, certainly for Ukraine, but even for the world at large. And I think when we take inventory of all that has been lost and destroyed, I think we will find that many aspects of religious and political life in Ukraine will have been irretrievably changed. So today, I'd like to consider the religious landscape in Ukraine prior to the war and use that as a baseline for comparative purposes to understand some of the developments the war has unleashed and to consider those that are likely to have significant impact on religious organizations, believers of all faith traditions, and the overall atmosphere of religiosity in Ukraine. Essentially, I will argue that given the polarization that all wars engender, as they push people into sharply defined groups and categories and pit them against one another, one group in this borderland region is likely to be highly affected. 
among the casualties of this war is likely to be the option of considering oneself just orthodox or prosto pravoslavni, as opposed to claiming that one belongs to a particular church associated with a certain patriarch who resides either in Moscow, Kiev, or Constantinople. The just orthodox, as they're called, are a group that embraces a sense of orthodoxy that is distinctly open and porous because it blends myriad forms of Eastern Christianity into vernacular religious practices. And as people are forced to choose an allegiance among newly remade choices, the religious landscape in Ukraine will be transformed. And I venture to say in other countries with Orthodox populations as well. So today I'll focus on this large sector of the Ukrainian population before the war, who saw themselves as prostopravoslavni, as just Orthodox, and analyze how this group came into being and what is likely to become of them. And I'll end with some initial thoughts on the dynamics that I see driving initial changes, uh, additional changes in the domain of religion and what we can expect as this tragedy unfolds. And after that, I would certainly welcome your questions and the opportunity to discuss these topics at such a perilous time. So Jen, could I have the uh, first slide of the map, please? And you can go to the map, the next one. Thank you. So the first point I want to make is that this is not a religious conflict, but a conflict with religious dimensions. It's not the first religious war of the 21st century as some have claimed. And I'll explain in a moment why I think so. But it is certainly a war in which religion, religious organizations and clergy play a very significant role. And I believe they will continue to do so in the aftermath of this war. Could I have the next slide, Jen? Uh, so the, the events uh, outlined here explain why Ukrainians insist that the invasion is experienced as an intensification of armed combat that began in 2014. I know these events might perhaps be well known to many people in Alberta, but I think it bears repeating that the events of 2014, that is to say the Maidan protests, the annexation of the Crimean Peninsula, and the beginning of a Russian-backed insurgency served to galvanize attachments to Ukraine and alter self-perceptions. Many people came to see themselves as no longer just residents or citizens of Ukraine, but as Ukrainian patriots, as they began to refer to themselves. And they used this identification regardless of confessional allegiance and regardless of which language they spoke. Could I have the next slide, Jen? More recently, with threats to Ukrainian sovereignty building, a parallel effort to strengthen Ukrainian state borders and a sense of Ukrainian nationhood led to enhanced state-driven efforts to secure a tomos of orocephaly and the creation of, an, uh, of a Ukrainian church that would be independent from Moscow. And the sequence of events that I've outlined here uh, revitalized the essential and even the pivotal importance of the ecumenical patriarchate. The key point is that in 2019, the jurisdiction of canonically recognized official religious life was no longer directed from Moscow. Could I have the next slide, Jen? The creation of uh, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine has led to, the, to two churches and a bifurcated choice of allegiance. The choice could be reframed as the Moscow Patriarchate and continued communion religiously and politically with Russia as represented by the, Orthodox, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate versus the ecumenical patriarchate in Constantinople and religious leadership in Kiev, which importantly was first recognized by the Greek Orthodox Church and represents a movement towards European integration that has political as well as religious dimensions. The choice of religious affiliation is freighted with political connotation. And note that I said political and not national connotation. This was the case prior 
to 2014, more so thereafter. And we can expect that this confluence of symphonia, of political position and religious affiliation being ever more tightly connected after the invasion. So just a bit of background again. Prior to the invasion, about two thirds of the Ukrainian population considered themselves Orthodox, which amounts to about 30 million people. The next largest group was the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church at around 9% and a block of anywhere from seven to 8% who said they were Christian. And then we have a variety of religious minorities, each of whom is under 2% of the population. That's primarily Baptists and other Protestant groups, as well as Jews and Muslims. And finally, we have about five or so percent who claim to be atheists or agnostics. However, and here, Jen, could I ask you for the next slide? When asked, as, as the Razumkov Center did, which Orthodox Church do you belong to? You see that there is a persistent large block of people who claim to be Orthodox, but specifically just Orthodox. In other words, they decline to name an allegiance to a particular Orthodox Church and Patriarch. These statistics that I'm showing you here are countrywide, yet there are regional variations. For example, in Eastern Ukraine, the percentage of just Orthodox is about 60%, the highest in all of Ukraine. So I'd like to consider how this group came into being and why might people consider themselves just Orthodox? The importance of this group is rising, not necessarily their numbers, but certainly their importance is growing. They are evidence of a certain soft confessionalism in Ukraine. They are swing voters of sorts in this newly created bifurcated choice between two churches whose liturgical, doctrinal, and aesthetic traditions stem from the same confessional heritage. <coughs> Excuse me. However, their understandings of the past and their visions of the future increasingly diverge. As an anthropologist <coughs> who conducts ethnographic research, <coughs> excuse me, and by that I mean participant observation and interview-based research, <coughs> the topics I have pursued always have emerged from my fieldwork and from being in Ukraine. When I initially began conducting research on religion, I focused on religious minorities, mostly small exotic groups who often lived on the margins of society. When I began systematically interviewing people who say they're Orthodox, I found many non-religious, non-affiliated people who called themselves just Orthodox, as opposed to Orthodox of a particular patriarchate. Often the category prostopravoslavni is mistranslated as simply orthodox. That would be a literal translation. But people who so self-describe are setting a limit. To identify as just orthodox is to withhold allegiance to a particular orthodox church, but claim allegiance to an Eastern Christian tradition. They are not undecided, nor are they unprepared for denominational choice as some have suggested. This group intrigued me because I quickly realized that very few of the established categories and concepts that we use to study religion apply to them. Some were even outright misleading. The very word religion itself was problematic. When I posed questions concerning religia or religion as opposed to vera or faith, I received very different answers Questions regarding religion usually elicited either blank stares, evasiveness, or charges of arrogant, distant clergy and the self-serving coercive institutions of which they're a part. Questions concerning faith, however, with no mention of the word religion, often brought forth references among the just Orthodox uh, to a spiritual advisor, Duhovnik, and the meaningfulness of this relationship. And when speaking of faith, People made references to the illustrious role orthodoxy has played in enriching and defining Eastern Slavic civilization and to its numerous accomplishments in the domains of art, architecture, and learning. 
rather than criticizing the profiteering, power-driven nature of religious institutions. Many just Orthodox I spoke with deny that they're religious. And indeed, few enter a church <coughs> and few participate in church-based church rituals, including communion. However, many pray regularly. They go to church to light a candle, participate in pilgrimages, and they attend exhibits, concerts, and performances with religious themes. Some do not know basic doctrines, including the Ten Commandments. However, when I see them actively practicing their faith in pervasive and public ways, and note the enormous political significance religious institutions wield, I find nothing nominal about it. People indeed believe, but not always in religion, and they practice to belong, but not always to a church. Their allegiance is to a faith tradition more so than to a specific institutional structure, to moral authorities who might be clergy as easily as they could be spiritual advisors, poets, or writers, to honoring the sacred, which they might find in cemeteries, nature, or at monuments, far more often than in a church. And all of this shapes practice and political orientations in decisive ways. The just Orthodox might participate in various forms of what Jean Corbina has called nomadic orthodoxy, meaning pilgrimages, processions, and other religiously inspired movement. These practices offer temporary communities that are quickly assembled for specific purposes and once fulfilled, quickly dissolved. These vernacular practices are not the result of Soviet anti-religious policies, which as I've argued elsewhere, primarily produced ignorance of formalized aspects of institutional religion, more so than upending belief uh, by seeding doubt, let alone atheism. These vernacular religious practices, however, contribute to the deinstitutionalization of religious practice and the ability to consider oneself meaningfully orthodox without ever entering a church. Some anthropologists have tried to capture what might be for some the counterintuitive nature of religiosity in orthodox societies by remaking Grace Davies' succinct depiction of the English uh, and their attitudes towards religion as believing without belonging. Some have said for Russians, belonging without believing is more appropriate. And once again, Jean Kormina refers to Russians as being part of a, quote, church of the unchurched. Mikhail Epstein refers to, quote, minimal religion to depict the Russian blending of mysticism, uh, faith, pure and simple, and estrangement from religious institutions. In Ukraine, the just Orthodox as casual believers, sympathizers, prihilniki, an atheist with tradition, as one says somewhat tongue in cheek, they engage religiosity as a form of self-help in response to the beat of cultural and political rhythms or out of a desire for cultural belonging, but they do it on their own terms. The vernacular qualities of this lived everyday religiosity simultaneously accommodate a guarded distance and an active attachment to institutional structures, a refusal to be coerced by them and the desire to belong to something greater than oneself. Vernacular religiosity is a vehicle to overcome institutional disaffection and suspicion of clergy while capitalizing on the validation and authentication of sacred status and correct practice that those institutions and their leaders offer to sites, objects, and people. Prior to the war, the just Orthodox deliberately rejected selecting a denomination in part because of the political implications with which they are freighted as either pro-Ukrainian, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, and previously the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Kiev Patriarchate, pro-Russian, and here I mean the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate, or in an earlier era, era pro-diaspora and pro-Ukrainian, the Ukrainian Autocephalous Orthodox Church. They are Orthodox because they embrace a confessional tradition and recognize its contribution to Ukrainian art, architecture, and other facets of cultural and history. And this makes for important differences between the just Orthodox and the growing number of nuns in North America and Europe who decline allegiance to a particular denomination and faith tradition on the grounds that they're spiritual but not religious. The just Orthodox refuse to commit to a particular institution, not because they're unable to choose, but because they're unwilling 
yet their allegiance to a faith tradition to which their everyday religiosity connects them, all the while maintaining a measured distance from religious institutions that indirectly validate their practices. Although their attachment to orthodoxy draws on a sense of cultural heritage and patrimony, it's not nostalgic or, or purely sentimental. Rather, being just orthodox allows them to reaffirm or negate relatedness and to morally validate the relationships that stem from being related and maintain and the effective atmosphere of religiosity that colors their everyday lives. So in short, to learn about Orthodox religious practices and beliefs, it became clear to me that it's best not to mention religion and church might not be the best place to go. <clears throat> this is what has prompted some scholars to refer to Eastern Slavs as nominally Orthodox or Orthodox in name only. But the concept of nominalism suggests that religion is not important. And after extensive ethnographic research, I've come to conclude that wavering commitments to an institution and critical attitudes towards religious leaders cannot be equated with nominalism, aversion, or even fossilized indifference. Rather, a pervasive soft confessionalism that has shifted religious practices out of religious institutions and into the public sphere has simply given religiosity, religious institutions, and religious leaders an import for politics and identity formation that does not follow traditional patterns. Some states claim secular governance over deeply religious citizenries, and here I would cite the United States. And in parts of Europe, we have states that mobilize religion, sometimes in the form of state churches, for the purposes of governing populations that are deeply secular. Being religious or embracing secularism as a political principle of governance in these contexts diverge because the enabling conditions that animate religiosity have shaped them differently. Many people I've spoken with over the years in Ukraine are like Ivan, a 54 year old businessman in Chernivtsi, Western Ukraine. And shortly after insisting that he was an atheist, he volunteered, well, I can't call myself a strong believer but somewhere deep down in our souls, we are all believers. If we believe it will be better, that means we've already become believers. It's not my intention to argue that religion is a universal trait or that it's inherently good or bad. Rather, I argue that since the collapse of the USSR, there has been a deepening of religiosity in Ukraine at the same time that processes driving secularization continue unabated. And this leaves in its wake a society that is simultaneously increasingly religious and enduringly secular. And one of the, my goals tonight is to explain why this is so by analyzing the processes <clears throat> that have produced dynamics and conditions that enable everyday religiosity. And as well as this kind of self-perception as just orthodox and the political utility of religiosity for governance that this yields. So the religious practices I observed and the inclinations to engage in them and the interpretations of their meanings are idiosyncratic and often tailored to individual needs. Yet because they are so pervasive and draw on a common Eastern Christian faith tradition, they amount to a collective expression of faith that feeds what I am calling an effective atmosphere of religiosity. The atmosphere that has emerged in Ukraine and the dispositions, sensibilities, and temperaments that stem from it have allowed religion to enter the public sphere, public institutions, and politics in significant ways. And when an atmosphere enhances a transcendent, forward-looking hope for a better future deep down in our souls, it primes the pervasive, persuasive, excuse me, the persuasive power of re religiosity and makes religiosity a political resource that now includes the weaponization and securitization of religion. The just orthodox, much like the so-called nuns elsewhere, do not necessarily reflect a reduction in religious practices or diminished appeals to otherworldly forces. Non-affiliation and the deinstitutionalization of religiosity are not reliable indicators of secularism. They should not be equated with indifference to a transcendent realm, or to a diminution of the political power of religiosity to shape ethical and moral beliefs and drive collective directed action. 
Rather, I argue that non-affiliation and deinstitutionalization set within an effective atmosphere of religiosity, nonetheless yields a responsiveness to religion as a means of self and collective definition. So an effective atmosphere of religiosity is one of the most important factors that create this large contingency uh, of just orthodox sympathizers and casual believers. The religiosity exists in the spaces between institutional religion and the places where everyday life unfurls. And I focused on the just orthodox because I understood them to be important politically. Uh, they're non-practicing only in the sense of formal religious rituals, but often highly active when it comes to engaging in vernacular religious practices. They're not engaged in religious affairs, but they're also not indifferent. They care that a, a tomos has been granted and that an independent Ukrainian church has been created, but they do not care enough to act actively participate in institutional religious life so as to help the church thrive. And one sentence in my book that I wrote that now brings me great pain is, quote, should conflicts flare, they might be detached enough to stay at home or politically mobilized enough to fight with a zeal that can only be described as religious. And given the almost total mobilization of the Ukrainian population in this war effort, I think we can conclude that being just orthodox has prompted the latter reaction. Being just orthodox does not in any way suggest a weakened or less stable national or citizenship-based identity. Rather, I argue, it reflects the myriad possibilities for practicing religion beyond institutional confines and even the preference for it. So now I'd like to focus on three elements in particular that feed into this creation of an effective atmosphere of religiosity. Uh, could I have the next slide, please, Jen? I'm gonna look at religious architecture, religious signs in the urban landscape and vernacular religious practices that occur in public space. So first, what you see is uh, Sufisky Sabor, of course, in Kiev, and the legendary sort of gold domes uh, of Kiev. And I think the pervasiveness of religious architecture uh, is one way in which the landscape of Ukraine is marked. Could I have the next slide, please, Jen? Uh, the next thing I would like to bring your attention to are religious signs. Um, you'll see here uh, a monument to the Holodomor, which obviously draws extensively on religious symbolism. It's moreover placed in front of Mikhailovsky Sabor, a Sabor that was destroyed uh, uh, under Stalin in the 1930s and rebuilt in independent Ukraine. What you see to the right of that uh, is one of the plethora of shrines that was built following the Maidan uh, in order to honor those who died uh, in February, 2014. Um, this sacralizes public space. Uh, these shrines have been so uh, multiple and so meaningful that now the state has, in fact, co-opted them and they are permanent fixtures in the urban landscape uh, in Kiev. Above that, you see yet another uh, uh, vernacular shrine that is, uh, was once again spontaneously built at individual initiative to honor um, someone who had gone to fight in eastern Ukraine. And it's, Mom, I will return. And you see, once again, religious symbolism and a drawing on religious sentiment. Uh, Jen, could I have the next slide, please? Um, and just to show the pervasiveness of this religious iconography in public space. Oh, I apologize for my clock. Uh, it's going to ring nine times, unfortunately, because that's where I am. <laughs> um, uh, here you see uh, on the left-hand side, um, a shrine to the Virgin Mary, which is before uh, a commercial property, a television station in Lviv, but it is public facing onto a square. To the right, you see uh, a, a metro station in Kharkiv, uh, the second largest city in Ukraine. And that is, uh, a, a, that is Saint Tatiana and a rendition of her that it can frequently be found in icons. My point is, these visual images are pervasive, whether it's in um, uh, individual private properties in commercial properties or in public space. Jen, could I have the next slide? Um, I would also like to note the um, tremendous growth 
of the chaplaincy that really took root, especially after 2014, spearheaded by the development of the military chaplaincy. Um, this is obviously a contemporary poster that um, speaks the 102 uh, chaplains who are now formal uh, employees of the armed forces. And it notes the uh, variety of faith traditions that um, these chaplains uh, come from. The spearheading of the military chaplaincy uh, put then chaplains in a variety of other uh, border guards, uh, in transportation centers, airports, train stations, and the like. It also spearheaded then the development of a variety of other chaplaincies, most notably the medical chaplaincy, prison chaplaincies, orphan chaplaincy, uh, even youth chaplaincy, which mean chaplains associated with educational institutions. In short, uh, especially since 2014, we've seen um, a tremendous entrance of chaplains into a variety of public institutions. And in many respects, they are like the just Orthodox in that they are clergy, and yet they uh, serve in a rather a, a lay capacity. Um, Jen, could I have the uh, next slide, please? Um, and that pervasiveness of religious signs in public space and clergy and serving in public institutions is further reinforced in creating this effective atmosphere of religiosity by the plethora of vernacular religious practices that certainly not just the just Orthodox, but especially the, the just Orthodox um, in which they partake. We see here to the left, um, the possibility uh, for placing prayer requests, it's at a cemetery, but this also exists um, in monasteries, for example. A great many people rely on the learned um, abilities of uh, monks to uh, intercede for them uh, and therefore ask them to make prayers for them. You have on the right the uh, very, very common practice of lighting candles and of which uh, substitutes for attendance at lit liturgies for, for many of the just Orthodox. Could I have the next slide, Jen? Uh, we see then a plethora of a great many of religious um, rituals that are conducted in, once again, in the great outdoors in public space. Here we see the famous Vodo Crescenia in January, where one reenacts the baptism in the River Jordan. The only difference is we don't have weather like they do in the Middle East. So it's into ice and water and freezing water. And could I have the next slide, please? Um, this kind of water-based uh, rituals is, is also very often integrated into pilgrimages. And here you have, again, um, bathing in a sacred spring. I might add this picture, I took this picture in February. Uh, and so even though uh, uh, the, the sacred spring doesn't show beyond this, uh, this bathing area is similarly uh, ice and snow. Uh, uh, participating in pilgrimages is something that um, a great many Orthodox partake in. So all of this by way of saying these three elements, these religious signs in public space and clergy serving in public institutions and the pervasiveness of these kinds of religious practices that are in public space and highly visible, and I might add very meaningful to many people, all of this adds up to the fact that um, religion is then extremely important in Ukraine, especially I would argue because it defines relatedness. By investigating how religious practices and concepts create relatedness, by linking individuals to each other, uh, to groups, to the dead, to the divine, and to a civilizational aesthetic tradition through lived forms of religion is often a far more productive approach to assessing the meaning and the relevance of religion in the lives of individuals or a particular group, more so than questions regarding belief or participation in formal religious rituals and institutional affiliation, as is a, a quite widespread practice. These kinds of relig uh, relationships color an atmosphere that shapes the life world and the context in which perceptions, orientations, and political behaviors form. In short, religiosity has moved into a spectrum of intimate, private, and public spheres and transformed the types of sites that are recognized as sacred and the practices that appeal 
to other otherworldly forces associated with them. When objects, places, and historic events can pivot to the sacred, to use Jonathan Smith's phrase at any given moment, this obliges us to expand what constitutes religion, why and where people might practice it, and what the consequences of these practices might be. So the existence of these practices also reveal the entanglements that are evidenced in interlocking paths in the present everyday lives of peoples and places that inform hierarchies of space, colonial reflexes, and institutional frameworks, all of which serve as legacies of these past encounters. Global flows do not just bring people's ideas and goods together, they order the hierarchies and power relations that inform the conditions of how spaces and peoples are interconnected. The lands now known as Ukraine and Russia have always been interconnected. They're just increasingly interconnected in different ways. And religion is a driving force in this regard. Jen, could I have the next slide? Uh, this is what has prompted me to uh, ask the question, um, is hi history secular? And I'm inspired to do so by uh, several anthropologists who raise the provocative question as to whether critique is secular. And they uh, asked this question, and by secular, I should preface this by saying, by secular, I mean a principle that centers on reason and purports to advance a certain neutrality towards religion. And secularism is usually demonstrated by a separation of church and state, a distinguishing of religious and political authority, and by extension, religion and law. But we need to ask to what extent um, religious underpinnings to conceptualization of truth inform critique and perhaps more broadly, whether they inform history or not, our understandings of history. Uh, the question those anthropologists asked is whether critique is secular. Uh, after the publication of the Danish cartoons that depicted Mohammed and Muslims more broadly, depending on your perspective, in either a humorous or a blasphemous way, their goal was to analyze the dismissive reaction of secular Europeans to the claims of moral injury and blasphemy that came from Muslims. And they contrasted this with other instances in which critique inspired similar forms of moral injury presented it, that presented itself as secular truth. The overall point of the book was that delineations between a religious worldview and a secular one, between religious truth and a secular truth can be perilously thin because the public sphere is never neutral, is never as neutral as it claims, uh, secularism claims it, it, it could be. And this is especially true when the public sphere is characterized by an effective atmosphere of religiosity. And this is what prompts me to ask whether historical narratives are secular. Um, given the commonality and the liturg liturgical doctrinal and aesthetic styles of both the Orthodox Church of Ukraine and the uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate, history becomes sacralized in a political vein and performatively enacted in vernacular religious practices in public space. And very briefly, I cite uh, just two examples here, uh, and that they have to do with World War II. Uh, of course, the uh, Ukrainian, uh, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine uh, favors uh, a version, uh, call, refers to the World War II um, as such, and commemorates Victory Day on May 8th. They tend to use World War II to highlight the frustrated aspirations for Ukrainian independence and its repeated crushing at the hands of uh, a Moscow-based government. The Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate, on the other hand, refers to the Great Patriotic War uh, and commemorates that on May 9th, uh, as they do in Russia, and posits that victory at this critical juncture was possible precisely because of the uh, combined efforts of what they posit is the Ruski Mir or the Russian world. Um, so given this significant uh, degree of overlap um, in the uh, uh, doctrinal and liturgical and aesthetic styles, uh, both of these institutions rely on specific and often, often opposing historical interpretation to influence perceptions of present circumstances. And just to give one other uh, quick uh, example, if you could go to the next slide, Jen, uh, I would say the, the baptism of Kiev and Rus, which of course uh, comes into the writings of Patriarch Kirill 
and uh, Vladimir Putin incessantly. And here you have a very famous procession of the cross uh, from 2016, in, which was organized by the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and the Moscow Patriarchate, whereby you had two processions, one beginning in Western Ukraine at Pochayev and the other in Eastern Ukraine at Svetohirsk Monastery and meeting then in Kiev, trying to symbolize their all Ukrainian aspirations and their uh, uh, potential for generating unity. Um, Jen, could you move to the next slide, please? Uh, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate is now under uh, extreme uh, pressure. When a war breaks out and you have these mythologized versions of the past, which often draw on a deep, distant past with claims that are difficult, if not impossible to verify, this lends itself to being infused with religiosity. The same, however, is true of historical narratives that appeal to memories of World War II that include victory, suffering, or thwarted attempts at independence during a war. This courts the potential to expand a conflict in which religion is present into a religious conflict between institutions, and this can function as a proxy or a shadow war to the military conflict between states. And this is why Tim Schneider has argued that in engaging in historical myth is like dancing with a skeleton. It gives an illusion of truth to a dead idea. Having said that, the persuasive powers of religious institutions are formidable. And given the performative, sensual, and symbolic means they have at their disposal to not only articulate a version of the past with moral authority, but also to make people experience it as true through ritual. This is what religious institutions offer politicians and historians. Um, the slide here is from a, um, an action that was recently done in Lviv, uh, 109 baby carriages, all empty to symbolize the children that have died in this conflict. Next slide, please, Jen. So what does this mean for the just Orthodox? And uh, what you see here is that um, uh, a reduction in their numbers. It took three years, but as you can see, when we come to the just Orthodox here, um, for the first time, there are fewer just Orthodox than there are adherents to the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. Um, and there are multiple reasons for that. And that's for the next few moments and just wrapping up, this is what I would like to focus on. Could I have the next slide, please, Jen? I predict that this <clears throat> reduction in just Orthodox will continue to carry on. You see here a statement that Patriarch Kirill uh, made the day the invasion occurred. You'll note the references once again to Kiev and Rus uh, and the uh, strain uh, sense of relatedness and belonging uh, given this war that his statements have created, given the unbridled targeting of civilians, civilian infrastructure, including religious infrastructure of people that are, uh, he portends to say, are part of uh, his uh, religious organization. And you'll note that he offered no clear condemnation of the war. Uh, the next slide, please, Jen. Uh, exactly one week later, he topped this on uh, Forgiveness Sunday when uh, in addressing once again uh, the conflict, um, he stressed the need, uh, the existence of a kind of a, a clash of civilizations and the need to block gay pride. And this then justifies the um, incursion, to use that word, uh, into Ukraine on behalf of Russian forces. In short, uh, these kinds of inflammatory statements by Patriarch Kirill exacerbate the position of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate. Could I have the next slide, Jen? And this uh, is then compounded by the growing militarization and the promotion of Orthodox conservatism among the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, and here you see the uh, tremendous, the main cathedral of the uh, armed forces in Moscow. All of this begins to color uh, by extension, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate. For the next slide, please, Jen. And with this, I wanna just conclude by uh, granted rather speculative uh, um, discussion of what might uh, happen to the just Orthodox in a post-invasion Ukraine. Um, already we see uh, movement among the uh, 
Moscow Patriarchate churches in Ukraine to first no longer pray to Kirill during services. And second, they have begun to ask for autocephaly, uh, again, uh, enhancing the importance of the ecumenical patriarchate um, for decisively directing the development of orthodoxy in Ukraine. Perhaps uh, this church could uh, secure autocephaly. Perhaps it could also combine with the uh, Orthodox Church of Ukraine. Um, there is tremendous trepidation in Moscow uh, should that come to pass, because today, uh, fully one third of the Russian Orthodox Church's parishes are in Ukraine. Moreover, three of the most important monasteries are also in Ukraine. Should these two churches combine and become one, they could potentially uh, challenge the status of Moscow as the third Rome. We could also, though, uh, have a continued uh, non-canonically recognized uh, uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate that breaks with the Russian Orthodox Church that carries on. And then one needs to say, will these differences in historical interpretations uh, and evo evocation of memories of the past be sufficient to articulate differences between this church and the Orthodox Church of Ukraine? Um, might this then be movement to introduce theological differences? a remaking of Symphonia away from, from the state to the, to the people as some hope, um, and as we saw during the Maidan. Another trend to be on the lookout for is, uh, given this rapid militarization of Ukrainian society and the newly fortified sense of Ukrainian nationhood as defined against an enemy occupier and invader, um, this is fertile ground for the growth of radical groups that most likely will lean on religious institutions for moral validation. Um, it, uh, I think the Orthodox Church of Ukraine is particularly vulnerable to um, becoming used by uh, the growth of potentially uh, radical groups that might uh, create or become more fortified. Nonetheless, the really the two most trusted entities in Ukraine are volunteers in the military and religious, religious organizations themselves. And I think this will continue to enhance this effective atmosphere of religiosity. And as a final comment, I would simply note that during uh, in this past month, two things really strike me that once again underline the importance of religion and religious organizations uh, for the just Orthodox, let alone for those who are practicing believers. Um, what has previously been decried as corruption or the reliance on siyazi or, uh, or informal informalities or unofficial means of, of, uh, of getting what you want, this those, those uh, practices and those networks have proven essential for the kind of self-organization, samoorganizatia, that we see in response to the invasion, and that has al allowed for the almost total mobilization of the Ukrainian population uh, as a response of this war effort. Ukrainians have proven themselves very nimble and flexible, but they have also grafted onto the networks of kin, fictive kin and acquaintances to get things done under dire circumstances. And they've also grafted onto the networks that religious organizations offer. And here I would mention specifically minority religious groups who have strong bases uh, in Ukraine and strong bases abroad, uh, most notably uh, Baptists and the plethora of Protestant groups. Also the Mormons are remarkably active. Um, Jews and uh, Jewish and Muslim groups as well um, have also responded with tremendous humanitarian aid and specifically uh, in efforts to um, advance evacuation. Those minority religious groups are tremendously active uh, in ways that are not proportionate to their numbers. And I think um, it's because they draw on their own networks that are within Ukraine and beyond Ukraine's borders. And lastly, I would not want to dismiss um, um, religious uh, institutions. We see the ecumenical patriarch uh, pledging to visit Ukrainian refugees in Poland. And this is a, a tremendously important symbolic gesture and appeals to the Pope, the Roman Catholic Pope to intervene. Um, just a final sentence, the, um, uh, the just Orthodox, I think 
um, are emblematic of the important role of religion in defining public space and public institutions and self and collective perceptions, particularly as they pertain to who one is related to and therefore who one feels an obligation and to where one belongs. But they're also emblematic of the religious pluralism and tolerance for a broad spectrum of attitudes towards religion and faith and towards inclusive forms of religious practices that allow the sympathizers, the agnostics, and the pious to practice together. When this war ends and we take inventory of all that has been destroyed, I suspect there will be far fewer just Orthodox, but I hope among the casualties, we will not find the pluralism and tolerance they represent. So I think I'll end it there and I thank you very much for your attention and I very much welcome any questions and comments you might have. Thank you. Sorry, you'd think we would remember to unmute ourselves after two years of this. But So thank you very much uh, for uh, really stimulating and, and, and really original uh, talk. This is so different from the, the highly institutional types of analyses that we're used to, used to when we think about religion in, in, uh, in con contemporary Ukraine. And so I think this has been really illuminating. Um, we have a few questions already in the chat and uh, to our audience, please feel free to um, add more um, and I will um, try to ask them. Um, uh, we have a number of questions that I think partly reflect uh, the, the fact that we sat for quite a while uh, looking at the religious figures, um, uh, the, the, the numbers of the, of the just Orthodox, but also, um, also reflects how, uh, how, how central this was to your, to your talk. So a number of questions ask about the, about the, the big change between 2016 and 2018 and 2019, or from 2016 to 2019 in that in that slide how um, the number of the, there's great variety in the number of just orthodox and uh, one person asks do you think their increase in 2019 had something to do with Poroshenko's loss and Zelensky's win in the election um, someone else points out that a change from 32 percent in 2016 to 46% in 2019 is really a remarkable change in, in three years. Um, and that's something that one would rarely see as a social scientist. So um, they're asking, could you talk a little bit about how this, um, how this data is collected? How do you account for that, for that change? Sure. Um, those were, of course, tremendously turbulent years when a great deal was in flux. Um, I think for those who are just Orthodox, um, if you remember at that time, Petro Poroshenko was very involved. I mean, it was really the signature accomplishment during his term in, in, his term in office that it was a tremendous uh, priority that he placed on achieving the Tomos and uh, bringing the Ukrainian, uh, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine into existence. Um, for a great many people who, uh, such as the just Orthodox, that was a mixed signal. Um, in other words, um, I think uh, there was fear that perhaps the, the domination that the a single Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox Church, for example, in Russia has, is not necessarily a model to be followed um, because of all that that pertains. I mean, you saw the uh, uh, quotes from Patriarch Kirill. Um, and I think it's that kind of caution over um, uh, political involvement in literally creating a church that caused concern among those who consider themselves just Orthodox. Um, I do think, for, ex for example, uh, President Zelensky, who won um, office, um, it was in part attributed to the fact that he claimed himself to be a secular Jew who had no intention of meddling in religious affairs. I think for many just Orthodox, that was considered a plus. Um, and so I think, uh, 
there is a tremendous shift there. These figures were all from the Razumkov Center, which in my opinion is probably the most reliable, but this was also a period when you had tremendous, tremendous shifts going on. Um, and so I think that's how I um, uh, uh, understand that shift. And I do think as much as the um, creation of, initial creation of an Orthodox Church of Ukraine was welcome, uh, for some people there was a, a, a guarded um, understanding um, as to what this might portend. I might add also, uh, it right away opened up uh, a plethora of, of um, difficult issues particularly as concerns the military chaplaincy, um, who can serve exactly? Uh, could the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate serve? Um, and what would, uh, what must their name be? In short, a variety of issues, which I'm happy to talk at greater length if anyone's interested, um, that once that um, suddenly made, uh, tarnished the reputation of Ukraine as being uh, beyond the Baltics, the single, uh, uh, place known for its religious tolerance and pluralism, I might add. Thank you. Um, we had another another question um, related to the the just orthodox uh, question, which was simply, um, uh, when was that when was that term first used? Uh, is that something that appears? Um, you know, over time in the Razumkov surveys, wh when when does that term emerge? And and the the questioner is also wondering if there's any any literature on the subject, um, any articles to recommend. And I think um, Kathy Warner is the person <laughs> who's written on this. But anyway, please go ahead. I think um, interestingly, I. I to my mind, uh, it's stunning that not much more has been written about it. And one of the reasons why um, I began to write on it is because uh, when you see statistical analyses, um, for example, when people would cite levels of adherence, I mean, Heather, as you mentioned earlier, we tend to think of religion in institutional terms. Um, and so when you would see, uh, you know, the question, which Orthodox Church do belong to, when people would then cite uh, percentages to whether it's the Kiev Patriarchate, Moscow Patriarchate, Autocephalus, or Orthodox Church of Ukraine, depending on the period, um, the numbers never added up. There was always an enormous gap until you hit 100, and almost no one explored that. That is to say, you'd have 15%, 20%, and those low, low, low levels of percentages of uh, affiliation. Um, but there was this large blog, 30 to 40%, or even in earlier periods, up to 50%. Um, uh, that would not, they would say they were orthodox, but not of a particular patriarchate. Um, and uh, different, uh, I, I've stuck with Razumkov because they consistently ask about prosto uh, just orthodox. Others, um, Kis, for example, the Kiev Institute of Sociology asks sometimes um, orthodoxy, but without a particular um, patriarch. That's a different kind of a question. And I think it's important to be consistent on this category of prostopravoslavny. And so that's why I've relied on, on their terms, but they have been using that term um, in, in the post-Soviet period. I, I don't wanna say exactly when, but um, uh, certainly in the 1990s, it was already being used then. Um, and so um, Precisely as an anthropologist, the kind of research I do, that is, uh, I mean, I give statistical uh, uh, data to paint a broader context, but the kind of research I do, in fact, uh, tries to explore who these just Orthodox are. Why might they not want to say they uh, are, belong to, let's say, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine or, or the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchy? It, and it's in looking at uh, what they do as opposed to what they say that led me to, uh, to really see the very visible and meaningful ways in which they practice their religion in this uh, sort of deinstitutionalized, but nonetheless related to religious institutions. They um, very often these practices, whether it's going on a pilgrimage, of course, this is at a monastery. So this is a formal religious uh, uh, institution and a formal um, consecrated religious site, but yet they uh, have 
they are able to uh, determine themselves the degree to which they have contact with clergy. And it is, as I mentioned, sort of a temporary community that very often can be formed um, should there be a need for, uh, uh, whether it's a form of self-help or, as I mentioned, or uh, just uh, commemorating Easter or other kinds of holidays. Um, in other words, these um, vernacular religious practices allow people to be as orthodox and as Ukrainian, as pious as they want, or as secular as they want. And I think that's one of the reasons why um, they are so pervasive. Uh, orthodoxy, uh, nonetheless, has this uh, elasticity to it um, that perhaps is not readily recognizable given their insistence on tradition and honoring tradition. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question on a slightly different angle, um, and I don't know if you know the answer, but um, uh, the questioner says, this year a Ukrainian Orthodox chaplain was appointed at the University of Alberta. Um, are universities in Ukraine open to chaplains serving on their campuses? We've got chaplains in the, in the military. Do you, do you know about the university setting? That is, um, that's starting. Um, and that is starting. Um, unfortunately, the dynamics and the trends that were in place, it's hard to, uh, these things are, are, are difficult legislatively and legally because all kinds, uh, everything has to be written and created. Um, but nonetheless, that was clearly starting. And I anticipate that continuing. I see no reason why that would slow down. Um, it started with the military chaplaincy, but quickly spread to many different um, other domains, as I mentioned. Precisely because things are difficult legislatively and le legally, there are not as many chaplains serving in a formal capacity. So in other words, um, uh, if, if one looks at formal figures of, of people that serve, uh, you get a misleading picture once again. It's ethnographically by simply being there, you see actually the preponderance of so-called volunteers who are nonetheless present. Um, and this I think is um, certainly most readily available when it comes to military chaplains. Um, prior to the war, there were about 400 or so, uh, I would say about, but somewhere between 400 and 420 or so of chaplains serving in an official capacity, but easily double that number serving in a volunteer capacity. So although a few universities um, have chaplains serving and some hospitals and uh, predominantly those who were serving um, soldiers coming from the war, uh, there was nonetheless a growing and demonstrable trend to include, for example, um, medical chaplains in uh, medical facilities, rehab centers, and the like. Um, they are then serving, by and large, they're serving in a capacity, capacity as a chaplain, but not necessarily as formal employees of those institutions. So in other words, it was ethnographically by being there and seeing their presence. Um, and seeing the extent to which many, uh, especially in medical facilities, that the chapels and the chaplains are also serving those who work in those institutions. So to answer your question, it, um, it's starting and I would expect it would continue when this war ends. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions now that, that deal with the sort of what next uh, part, of your, uh, part of your talk. Um, Another of our listeners uh, says, thank you. Um, if the number of just Orthodox drop in number because of the war, what does this imply for the effective atmosphere of religiosity that supports it? Does it retreat, disappear? Can you talk a little bit about, about that? Sure. Um, I, I think it's the effective atmosphere of religiosity that has created the just Orthodox, not the just Orthodox that have created the effective atmosphere. In other words, uh, it is the presence um, in these religious signs um, and in the religious architecture and in the prevalence of clergy in public institutions that I think has created this effective atmosphere. Um, that atmosphere, I believe, was intensified during the Maidan, and I believe the in invasion will intensify it again. 
So if anything, I think the number of just Orthodox is likely to recede quite simply because the choices have become much more stark. That is to say, whereas before the war, people might have seen the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate simply as their local church, not necessarily as the arm of Moscow reaching into their town or neighborhood or village. Uh, they might have seen familial connections to that church, for example, perhaps their parents were helped renovate it or they themselves were married there and the like. Those were reasons for uh, going there to light a candle, not so much uh, a statement of a political position, but under the conditions of war, and in particular under the uh, kinds of statements um, that Patriarch Kirill has made. Um, I think this is going to put tremendous pressure on the Ukrainian um, Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate to, in some way, formally um, and quite clearly define its relationship to the Russian Orthodox Church. And so therefore, you're going to get a, a far sharper um, uh, politically crafted distinction of what the differences between those churches are. And I think under the conditions of this invasion and the tremendous um, atrocities committed against civilians, this is going to prompt more people to perhaps choose away from something that could or could be construed to have uh, connections with Russia, Moscow, uh, Putin, and the patriarch uh, uh, and the Moscow Patriarchate. So that's what I think will um, affect um, the reduction in the number of the just Orthodox. And will continue to enhance the effective atmosphere of religiosity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Another question uh, is, you've pointed out that just Orthodox are also a manifestation of the ongoing deinstitutionalization of Orthodoxy in Ukraine. In times of crisis and much trauma, we know that more people seek solace in religion and in organized religion in particular. What might be the future for organized religion in Ukraine? That is, uh, in Ukraine after it wins the war, as our question. <laughs> Like, I agree completely. Um, well, this, I mean, I think it depends on um, uh, what the institutional landscape looks like. And I think that is still uh, yet to be determined. As I mentioned, I mean, the uh, it's the Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate that has multiple options for redefining and repositioning itself. And I think much remains to be seen how that plays out. I do, I, I do believe that the reduction in the just Orthodox is going to result in um, perhaps a stated allegiance to a particular church. I do think these kinds of vernacular religious practices will continue unabated, which perhaps um, as they have in the past for the just Orthodox will alleviate um, or substitute for, I should say, perhaps formal attendance at liturgies. It's not to say that I anticipate um, that's gonna radically uh, increase, but I do think uh, a stated, uh, uh, no longer this in between two chairs, uh, kind of uh, you know, could be one, could be the other, just orthodox. This kind of amorphous um, uh, subscription uh, will emerge and in parallel to the rise of Ukrainian language, whereas, you know, other anthropologists have written about the uh, non-reciprocal bilingualism of people shifting back and forth. Um, um, we all notice a tremendous rise in any kind of formal context, especially of the use of, uh, even I would say the exclusive use of Ukrainian language. And that's, a, you know, in many parts of the country. So I expect um, the stated allegiance might change, but not necessarily the deinstitutionalized nature of vernacular religious practices. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I just want to remind our audience that you're welcome to put any questions that you have into the Q and A um, section in the bottom center of your of your screen. Um, I'm going to take an opportunity to ask a, a question. Um, can you can you tell us a little take us a little bit into your ethnographic work? Um, how do you how do you research 
50% of Orthodox who say that they are just Orthodox. How do you, how do you find that these people? How do you get a sense of the representativeness of who you're looking at? Just tell us a little bit about, about uh, how you do this. Please. Well, the first thing, which I, as I mentioned, the first thing that, that I learned was not to mention religion. Um, that arrested all interviews right away. <laughs> people would then begin to recommend people who were uh, pious and practicing um, that I should speak with someone su such as uh, that kind of a person if I wanted to know anything about religion. And the same person who would say that, no, no, they're really... Um, uh, they don't know anything about religion and they're non-practicing, I would see them nonetheless uh, engage uh, in these kinds of vernacular religious practices. And so I look specifically at what people do uh, as opposed to how they, what kind of label they give themselves. Um, uh, Prosto Pravoslavni fit most of them, and they they did not uh, uh, distance themselves from that kind of an identification. Um, and so, in other words, I begin. Uh, it was being at both partaking in things like these uh, uh, processions and these pilgrimages that had a whole variety of people that were appealing to institutionalized religion, but once again, on their own terms for a wide variety of reasons. And some that were religiously based, some that were culturally based, sort of as a, a, a way of realizing a sense of being Ukrainian or being once again uh, connected to uh, relatives and in particular to uh, relatives who had passed away. What got me interested in the just Orthodox primarily was the tremendous, I started off looking at death rituals actually. And um, the preponderance of, I mean, when you come, let's say from the United States, it's very striking the, um, the importance uh, of commemorating uh, relatives who have passed away. Um, and so I began by looking at that, and I found many of those who, uh, many of the just Orthodox were very, very committed to commemorating in a both an institutional and a non-institutional way, um, the various anniversaries of whether it was a spouse or a sibling or what have you, um, their passing. Um, and so it's via death, whether it's of, uh, of, of a person to whom one is genuinely related, or when one looks at historical commemorations, where you have another kind of manifestation of relatedness, whether it be at the level of the nation or in other instances, uh, relatedness to this greater uh, Ruski Mir, Slavic world. Um, it's in a commemorating death in whatever form connected people into certain kinds of relationships and established a sense of relatedness and was a manifestation of the moral obligations to honor those relationships. So it was via the commemoration of death. That's basically how I got into the just Orthodox. And then it was only belatedly sort of afterwards realized that uh, sociologists, Ukrainians, not so much Westerners, but uh, Ukrainians themselves had devised these other kind of amorphous qualities, categories, I meant to say, for measuring this group that refused to state um, once again, depending on the period of time and allegiance to the Kiev Patriarchate or the Moscow Patriarchate. Who didn't want to be nailed to, <laughs> right. to the wall. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your, your colleagues in Ukraine and, and um, the, the study of, 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 of religion by um, anthropologists in, in Ukraine. And, and you know, you, you, I, I mentioned at the beginning your, the, the working group that you've been working with, which I realize um, is, is, is a group of scholars working across, across um, Eastern Europe and Eurasia. But could you tell us a little bit about that, that community? Sure. Um, that is what has sensitized me to um, uh, these networks and the religious uh, networks that are there that uh, I see uh, highly activated um, in this moment of crisis. That is to say, when you start looking at lived religion, um, you start to see uh, the extent to which certain, and this is what is distinctive, I think, about Ukraine, and it's among the factors that have um, 
created the kind of influence that has distinguished Ukraine from Russia in a religious sphere, for example. Um, these kinds of networks, and in particular, sort of developing the chaplaincy, for example, um, there's been a tremendous amount of import coming from the Catholic Church, as well as from a variety of Protestant traditions. Um, while those might not be large religious communities within Ukraine, they have prominent networks that are abroad. And the Catholic Church, obviously, and Protestant churches, especially those in the United States, of course, have tremendous um, experience with chaplaincy and developing it, uh, training chaplains, and once again, crafting legislation and, uh, and the like. And Ukraine has been able to tap into those uh, networks um, and fast track the kind of development of the chaplaincy. And um, I would say they're tapping into them now once again, in terms of providing a variety of, of humanitarian and other forms of aid. Um, the legislative um, uh, arena in Ukraine was far more uh, open and permissive to a variety of religious uh, groups. And for that re re reason, there has been a tremendous um, influx of a wide variety of religious groups that are in Ukraine. And in fact, even I would go so far as to say as use Ukraine as a springboard to other parts of the former Soviet Union. That means that um, Orthodox communities are in dialogue with other religious communities that are in dialogue with other religious communities that operate on a global scale. So in short, there's a variety of influences that are active on religious institutions in Ukraine. And we don't see that kind of counterpart of, uh, of religious uh, institutions, much less located abroad, having the, anywhere near the same degree of influence uh, in Russia in any form. Yeah, no, I think that, that Ukraine is really quite quite unique, uh, and not just not just in the former Soviet Union, but in on the European um, landscape in its pluralism and in its interconnectedness. So that's a very, and that's certainly something you've worked on in your career. Yeah. Um, I have, uh, I guess we're getting close to the end of our time. I have a couple more questions. Um, uh, this one connects to what you've just been talking about a little bit. Um, when I hear you speaking about just Orthodox, I'm reminded of many colleagues and friends here in North America who insist that they are just Christian rather than religious. To me, the more narrow focus on orthodoxy in such self-identification is an important, unique feature of contemporary Ukrainian modern identity. This striving toward secular personal religiosity among today's Ukrainians to me is also a manifestation of the ongoing evolution of civic society in Ukraine, the growing sense of personal agency. Can you comment on your respondents' larger lives? Are they civically active? Um, that's a good question. And I do think it's important, this idea of individual agency, because this is very much what I see playing out in the Just Orthodox. They wish to retain that kind of agency so as to tap into the agency of supernatural powers or divine powers. So um, um, uh, that's a very, very key point there too. Um, uh, just to uh, begin to scope out how the just orthodox might be different from either those who claim they're none or those who are spiritual but not religious. Um, I, mostly when people claim to be none, um, it's because um, the, in, in a great many instances they have lost uh, a reverence or uh, the institutions no longer uh, are uh, attractive and no longer beckon. And this is where you get the spiritual, not religious. Um, the just Orthodox, I believe, wish to, uh, by and large, establish a, a certain distance or take institutions on on their own terms. But many of their practices and many of the places where these vernacular religious practices unfold are related either uh, directly in a monastery or in a church or indirectly in let's say a cemetery or uh, some other kind of site that um, is connected to an institutional form of religiosity. So the, it's the confessional tradition that I think is very distinct. Um, I think perhaps a, um, 
A better comparison would be to Jews. And this goes also to answering another question in the Q&A because the time is uh, running out. I wanted to just combine them. Um, I don't think there's so much just Catholics, or, um, but there might be perhaps just Jews. That is to say, we see, um, uh, we see in the uh, similarly those have uh, who conduct uh, statistical research have difficulty finding categories to describe, uh, let's say, non-practicing, non-observant Jews, who uh, who nonetheless perhaps see themselves as Jewish, and perhaps pray, and perhaps have a Torah, perhaps uh, uh, had a had a bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah. They uh, identify with other Jews. They care about commemorating the Holocaust. They care about Israel. Uh, but yet one, uh, one searches for ways to describe them. And I think the, the, the main difference then between Jews, let's say in North America, who would fit that kind of a profile and the just Orthodox is very often um, what are called often the Jews with no religion or cultural Jews or ethnic Jews or what have you. They, uh, um, uh, they sometimes have lost um, uh, this kind of a subscription to uh, higher forces and, and, and they don't subscribe to the same kind of belief in miracles and spirits and all kinds of uh, God uh, that many of the just Orthodox do. The just Orthodox uh, have varying degrees of belief, but many acknowledge some form of higher power. Um, uh, but so it's a question of uh, recalibrating the balance between belief and institutional affiliation, but it's going back to this sense of relatedness. That's where I think Jews and let's say the just Orthodox have certain similarity. It's via religion that connects one both to previous generations and similarly to future generations, as well as to people in, in a particular present with whom you feel connected because you are related to them and this finds expression in religiosity. Um, and that's kind of distinct. I think um, there are few just Catholics, although one speaks of cafeteria Catholics, but I think there's a, that's sort of a more, uh, that's more predominant in, let's say, uh, a North American and a less so in a European and, and for other reasons, less so in a Ukrainian kind of context. Thank you very much. Well, I think we've come to the end of our of our time, and uh, I just want to thank you, uh, Catherine Warner, for such a stimulating and uh, and and original talk, and for a wide ranging conversation. And I want to thank our audience members for their for their excellent questions. Uh, please, I think that the um, we have recorded this evening's session, and so it will be available. Um, soon uh, on our on our uh, CIUS uh, YouTube site. Um, is there anything else that I have forgotten to mention uh, before we say goodbye? No? I would okay. just thank everyone for being here and for uh, uh, for all your wonderful questions and um, and I hope everyone will um, stay tuned to everything that's happening in Ukraine and stay committed. Mm -hmm. So we'll end by saying to please watch for Kathy's new book, uh, which is coming out. And I should have put that, uh, that announcement in the chat and I forgot. Um, and, uh, and we end this evening uh, by pausing and thinking of all those who are suffering uh, in Ukraine, across its borders, amongst people abroad who are worrying about family and, uh, we hope that next year we, when we hold our next next Bogdan Batyurkov lecture, that we will have a, a victorious Ukraine and we will be building a new a new world. So on that note, good night and thank you very much.